please give a warm welcome to Susie Finkbeiner. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this morning's drive over was a little terrifying, <laughs> I must admit, from Grand Rapids. It was very rainy, but um, when I arrived here at the library, I was welcomed with such warm smiles and with a really fantastic reading group that came to discuss the book and um, that made it all worth it. So thank you for coming. Um, just a little bit more about myself than I put in the bio. Um, I live in the Grand Rapids area and I have three teenagers. My daughter is 17 and she is a writer and um, so she would be probably the third generation novelist in my family. And my boys are turning 16 this summer and they don't write, but that's okay. We can still love them. But um, we have just a very normal life. I just have a very strange job. <laughs> one of the questions that I get asked often about my books is, is, number one, how I got started writing. So I'll just go through that just a little bit. I grew up in a family of storytellers. And my dad would, would tell us all these stories. Some of them were true, and some of them were not. And I have been piecing out, figuring out which ones were not true <laughs> still. Um, and my mom was the kind of mom that would read to us kids, and she would read with all of the different voices of the characters. I'm the youngest of four. And so when the older kids would bring home books that they were supposed to practice reading, my mom would say, go read to Susie. And so I would sit on their laps and I would listen to them read from these little books. And I have a very distinct memory. Um, my oldest sister is five and a half years older than I am. And I have a memory of sitting with her as she read me books, book after book after book, and knowing in that moment that I was deeply loved. And so to me, I have always associated stories with love. And so when I write a book and I'm able to share it with readers, it feels like we're sharing in some kind of this big story family together. So thank you for being here and joining me in that. I started writing when I was in elementary school and my friends and I would write stories together and we had lots of fun. Then I would write for extra credit in high school because I was a nerd. and. Um, in college, I was an English major, so I did a lot of writing. But it wasn't until I was an adult and I was working at a church and we couldn't afford to purchase a Christmas play one year. And so I jokingly said, I'll write one. And they didn't know that it was a joke. And so the pastor came to me a few weeks later and said, how's that play going? And I said, great. So I wrote a Christmas play. And so I started my professional career as a playwright. Um, don't look up the play that I have published. It's not, it's not good. It's not really good. So don't, don't go looking for it. But then one day a friend said, why don't you try to write a novel? And I said, that's nutty. Like, who does that? That's too hard. And then I started thinking, maybe I write novels. And so I would sneak off after work, and I'd go to a coffee shop for one hour, once a week, and I would write. No one knew, not even my husband knew what I was doing. He thought I was just going to a coffee shop to read a book. The barista knew, because she was saying, why are you here all the time? So I told her. But then one day I did tell my husband, and he said, take two hours. So. He was the first person to be a patron of my writing. And after I wrote that first novel, I thought, maybe I'll try to make a career out of this. So I sent it off to a bunch of agents, and I got a bunch of rejections. I sent it off to some editors, and I got a bunch of rejections. And I thought, well, maybe I need to learn more. So I went on my blog, because it was back in the days when everybody was blogging, 
and I said to my readers, give me a protagonist, a setting, and a conflict, and I'll write a short story. All the ideas I get, I'll write a short story in the month of September, thinking I would get three stories, but I got 32. So I wrote 32 short stories in one month, and that taught me so much about writing. So if any of you are writers, or if any of you have any aspiration, any dream, here's the thing. You have to keep working at it. Try new things. Um, try different avenues. Keep learning how it works, because you will learn so much. And you'll learn about yourself, not just about the thing that you're trying to do. That was how an editor got interested in me and offered me a book deal. That is not how it usually works. But that's how my professional novel writing career has gone. And so now, The All-American is my ninth novel. And I've written nine novels in 10 years, which is fast. And um, I'm slowing down, which is nice, because I have teenagers. I'm, I'm busier now than I was before. But um, it has been a lovely career. And I've met some amazing people, including you, through this career. Another question that I often get asked is, how do you get the ideas for your stories? And the answer is different for each novel. Um, for instance, the novel down there called Stories That Bind Us, I could not come up with a story idea. Every idea I sent to my editor, she said, I don't think that's the one. 30 story ideas, all a no. So then, my family and I went to Detroit, and we went to Belle Isle. And we walked into the aquarium, and I saw the jade-colored tile on the ceiling, and the whole story idea for that novel popped into my head. And I thought, this is going to be such an easy novel to write, because the idea came easily. No, no, it was very, very difficult. For this story, The All-American, the idea came in a very, very different way. Does anyone in here remember the year 2020 for any reason? <laughs> remember like how not much happened that year because <laughs> we were at home? That was the year that I discovered audiobooks. And this plays into how I got the idea for the All-American. I was washing dishes and listening to the audiobook for A Good American Family by David Marinus. David Marinus um, grew up in Detroit, and his father worked for the newspaper in Detroit. He was a journalist. He was respected. He was on a career path. And in 1952, he was accused of being a communist. And this is the story about how that up ended their lives. Um, essentially, what happened is that the House Un-American Activities Committee was going around researching and investigating and trying to dig up pockets of communism. This is McCarthyism, and um, trying to root it out. And they had a woman named Bernice Baldwin. And if you were in the, in the readers group this morning, you heard about her. Bernice Baldwin was this little, unassuming, elderly woman. She was a widow. She was a grandma, a retired nurse. And she also had been serving as a spy for the government in the Communist Party of Detroit, Michigan for nine years. And she went to, to um, Washington, D.C. and testified about the problem of communism in Detroit. And she named a bunch of names because her job in the Communist Party was to be the records keeper. And so she had everyone's name. But the problem is that she didn't just have names of people who were in the Communist Party. She had people who had gone to a meeting in the 30s because they were curious. She had names of people who um, were in the union things like that, and so she just named them all. And many of them were not, in fact, communists. But when they were interrogated, they were told, if you give us more names of communists, we'll go easier on you. And so 
They just started naming people. And I like to think that if I were in that situation, I would say, I will not tell you any names. I will not falsely accuse anyone. But if I think about it, people were losing their jobs. They were losing their homes. They were losing their family. Um, some people were going to jail for a very long time. And some people were being, a married couple was executed for their involvement in the Communist Party in, in America. So they were afraid. They were very afraid. And so they did what they had to do. And it's easy for me to, to stand on a moral high ground from where I am, not accused of a single thing. Um, but it's a lot harder when you think, how am I going to feed my children? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to take care of my reputation? And so I was reading this book, listening to it, and um, obviously I then made a lot of notes in it. But it was so fascinating that this happened two and a half hours from my front door, where I live now. And just thinking about the history of that and how it really wasn't all that long ago. And about how fear, when we allow fear to overtake our rationality and logic, we are capable of some pretty terrible things. And at the same time, I was reading a book that had just released that was recommended by my friend Andy. And it's called The Incredible Women of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League by Annika Arak. This book was like sunshine to the rain. <laughs> this book was pure joy. Um, it is all about the women who played in, you've seen a league of their own, haven't you? It was the women who played in that league in the 40s and 50s. And I knew about it, but I didn't really know about the league. I only knew what the movie told me. And so this book not only tells you their stories, but it has the most endearing illustrations. They are they're so sweet and beautiful, and you really get an idea of the spirit of the women who played. The All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, and I am, I am sweating up here talking about it because we have a gentleman who is from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League Players. Players Association, whose mom was an original player for the Racine Bells, the winner of the first championship. Even though the movie says it was the Peaches, it wasn't. I have theories about why they made the Peaches wing. It's because they had pink uniforms and they were cute. <laughs> and Racine was yellow, yellow and brown, yeah. Not as cute, but still cool. But as I was learning about the league and how it started because the men were off to war. And so there wasn't going to be baseball. But we had Rosie the Riveters in the factories. Why not have baseball players who wore skirts? And so um, Philip Wrigley, who was the chewing gum guy, thank goodness for him, my favorite gum. He also had inherited the Cubs, right? Is that, I believe that that's how it, he was the owner of the Cubs. And so he thought, let's have a league for the women. And so he sent scouts out and they had, they had tryouts, they had spring training. And these women, not only were they good for girls, they were good for guys too, they could face off with the men who were playing. And I've watched some of the reels of these women playing and they were fast and they were skilled and they were tough cookies. Like, okay, a guy slides into home, he's wearing pants, it still hurts him. A woman in a mini skirt slides into home, the pain, the pain, like she would bleed and then she would get up and keep going. These women, they had spunk, they had grit, and they were in love with the sport of baseball. And so I was learning about the league and just learning about these women and their stories and how 
many of them um, never got to play a, an organized sport at home. They learned just playing with the neighborhood guys. They learned by playing catch out in the backyard with their dads. These women, they created something that I benefited from as a student athlete because I wouldn't have had the sports that I had if it hadn't been for them. Um, I had the honor of meeting Mary Moore, who, um, if you ever get the chance to see her, hear her speak, you will be, number one, you will laugh so hard because the woman is like a stand-up comedian. The stories she tells about um, just the tricks they would play on each other. They were constantly short sheeting each other's beds. They were always playing pranks on each other. But the way that she also talks about the passion for the game of baseball, it's amazing. Um, one thing that I was, I was particularly amazed by with her is that between her first and second season, she worked in a factory and there was an accident and she ended up um, having, losing parts of her finger. And, um, in, and she was a second baseman, so she had to be able to throw, and she had to be able to throw with accuracy. And instead of giving up, she taught herself how to throw all over again. And she played two more seasons. And in all of the research I did, of the All-American girls that played baseball from 1943 to 1954, these women all had that spirit where they were not going to give up because they had worked too hard to get where they were. So when I was reading this, this um, sweet book about baseball and this sad book about communism, I realized that the timelines met up. And I thought, well, what's more American than baseball? Not a whole lot. And what's less American than being falsely accused of being a communist? Not a whole lot. Wouldn't it be interesting if I put them together in a book? Because if there is one thing I know about being an American, it's that we are complex. <laughs> there are so many layers to us, so many layers to our culture, so many layers to ourselves, and I think that that's even more apparent now than even in 2020 when I started writing this book. Writing, the experience of writing The All-American was at once just a complete joy, and then also completely infuriating. Because when I started writing this book and I started doing my research, you can see all of my notes, all baseball. Everything was about baseball. I even had my, um, I'll try and find it if I can. I had uh, my fictional team, the Sweet Peas, all figured out names, positions, all of, oh, there it is. So I had it all figured out. So if you want to see their names and what position they play, it's all right here. I had it figured out who the manager was and the chaperone because, oh, these teams had chaperones. The, the women had a, a woman who would give them permission to go on dates and who would make sure that they wore their lipstick because they had to wear red lipstick on the field or they would pay $5. Um, and I had all of that figured out. I was going to write the entire thing from the perspective of the one baseball player, Bertha Harding, who was going to play for a fictional team called the Workington Sweet Peas. Um, the reason I did a fictional team is that it is hard to write that many historical figures <laughs> into a book with accuracy. And so I just made people up. But of course we had a Dottie because every team, I'm pretty sure it was in league rules that every team had to have a Dottie, it seems, because they all did have at least one. But as I started writing, Bertha was a breeze. 
It was her sister Flossie that was the problem. Flossie was supposed to be 17 years old and the posh, stereotypical 1950s girl with the nice ponytail and the poodle skirt and going to the dances and wanting to be a housewife. But Flossie decided that that was not who she was going to be. And so she came out a little differently. Do you mind if I read to you just because it's easier to read Flossie than to describe her? Flossie is 11, just so you know. I couldn't have known from personal experience. I'd never been sent to the office before, but rumor had it that Principal Braun kept a paddle that he used on very naughty children. I'd even heard that it had holes drilled into it so it would leave welts. There was a story that one boy was so scared that he wet his pants right when Mr. Braun lifted the paddle. Then, from what I heard, he got another smack because he'd made a mess of the principal's slacks. I wasn't sure if any of that was true. Still, I'd made a stop at the little girl's room just in case. A girl couldn't be too careful. I stood just outside the office, biting my lower lip so I'd remember not to let it tremble. And I told myself over and over in my head that I was not going to cry. Not even if I got the paddle. Not even if Mr. Braun said he would have to call my mother. Holding up my chin, I walked into the office. Well, wobbled might have been the better word for it. I still wasn't used to wearing high heels. I handed Mrs. DeYoung, the school secretary, the note from my teacher, Miss Lang. Miss Lang hated me. Florence, Mrs. DeYoung said, clutching her pearls and looking me up one way and down the other. Oh, my. I grabbed the sides of my skirt and twisted the cotton between my fingers. I couldn't tell if, oh, my, was said in awe or pity. <clears throat> I'm supposed to see Mr. Braun, I said, with the smallest little bit of a shake in my voice. Please? Okay. She got up from her chair and smoothed her skirt the teacher's note still folded in her hand. She hadn't even read it. While she was gone in the principal's office, I looked down, noticing that the two rolled up wads of toilet paper I'd stuffed in my undershirt had gone a little cockeyed. Making, making sure nobody was looking, I did my best to adjust them. Florence, Mrs. DeYoung glanced down at my blouse and cleared her throat. Yes, I said, dropping my hands. Principal Braun will see you, she said. The lip I'd tried to remind to keep still started to tremble. Oh, here, dear, Mrs. DeYoung whispered. Then she used her own hanky to wipe under my mouth. Your lipstick is just a bit smudged. It's my sister's, I whispered back. Is that so? Yes. Well, it's a very pretty color. She dabbed a spot near the corner of my lips. I think it might have just gotten away from you a little. Thank you, I said. You've never gotten in trouble at school before, have you? I shook my head. And you're scared, she asked. I nodded. Well, that was all she said. Then she took me by the shoulders and turned me, pushing me into the principal's office. Mr. Braun was at his desk reading what I guessed was the note my teacher had sent, when he sent me with. He didn't look up when I stepped in. Miss Harding, he said, have a seat. I did. And while I waited him for, for him to read the note, honestly, how much had Miss Lang written? I searched the room for the paddle and decided he must have it hidden somewhere behind his desk because it wasn't in plain sight. He took off his reading glasses before looking up at me. Oh, he said. It was like I'd tossed confetti and yelled surprise. I guessed he'd never seen an 11-year-old girl with a full face of makeup before and a shirt full of wadded up toilet paper. If only he could have seen the high heels on my feet, also full of wadded up toilet paper. A girl has to make up for her lack somehow. Miss Harding, do you have a paddle? I asked the words out before I could even think about them. Excuse me? Do you have a paddle? I folded my hands together in my lap with holes drilled into it so it gives kids welts. Well, that isn't why there are holes. Because if you're going to paddle me with it, I have a right to know. I pushed my lips into a thin line and squeezed my hands together all the harder. 
Miss Harding, in my 20 years as a principal, I have never paddled a little girl, he said. Now, would you like to tell me why Miss Lang sent you to my office today? As a matter of fact, I said, I'd rather not. I must insist that you do. He cleared his throat. How about we start with you telling me why you came to school dressed like that? Oh, I didn't come to school dressed like this. Beg your pardon? Well, of course my mother wouldn't have let me leave the house like this, I said. I changed in the girl's room before the first bell. I see. He scratched the top of his head, which made me think he definitely didn't understand. That was fine. He was a man. He didn't need to. Next, you'll want to know why I changed, I said. Is that correct? He nodded. I wanted to look older, a little more mature. I crossed my ankles. Being the smallest in my class is the pits, you know. I'm sure it is. He glanced at Miss Lang's note. Now, if you will tell me about what happened with Iris Markowitz. I bit the inside of my cheek because I really didn't want to tell him about that. Iris Markowitz was the prettiest, best dressed, most well-liked girl in our class. She thought she was the smartest, but she was wrong. It was me, I was smartest. Bertha had warned me not to brag about it, though, saying that nobody liked a know-it-all teacher's pet. Well, I wasn't there to make friends. At least that was what I told myself when I ate lunch all alone or heard the girls talk about the slumber party I hadn't been invited to. Miss Harding, Mr. Mr. Braun said, what happened between you and Iris? She made fun of me, I answered. The year before, the kids in my class had made up a song about me, which wasn't nice in the least. It was called Little Baby Bumpkin. They'd made up scads of verses that had me living in a pumpkin and marrying a munchkin. My big brother Chippy had told me not to let it get to me, that those kids were just trying to get my goat. Most days, I could ignore them, keeping my nose firmly planted in a book. But that day, Iris had gone too far. She would pointed out my toilet paper bosom and sang under her breath, but loud enough for most of the class to hear a brand new verse of the Baby Bumpkin song. Little Baby Bumpkin, sucking on her thumpkin, she'd sang, never adored because she's flat as a board. That was it. I couldn't take it another second. What happened next? Principal Braun asked. I slapped her across her stupid face, I said. He blinked a couple times real slowly like he didn't quite believe what he'd just heard. That's all, I said. Are you going to paddle me now? He squinted at me before shaking his head. No, Miss Harding, I am not, he said. What a relief. But, he said, I do believe I'll have to talk with your mother. Oh, no. You do not need to talk to my mother, I said. Florence, you may call me Flossie, I interrupted. Flossie, I've heard that you're a good student. He pushed his lips together hard, and it made the corners of his mouth turn into a frown. But I make good grades, I said, not pointing out that I had the best grades in my entire class. That would have been arrogant. School is about more than grades. What a thing for a principal of a school to say. Your teacher seems to think you haven't tried very hard to make friends. He held up the letter from Miss Lang, waving it in front of me. Don't you have any friends at all? Of course I do, I said. It wasn't a fib. Not entirely. I had plenty of friends if the characters from books counted. Besides, Chippy was my friend sometimes. Bertha was too. How about friends in your class? Mr. Braun asked. Oh, no, I answered, shaking my head. They don't like me at all. Why do you think that is? I couldn't tell you. Would it hurt to put forth a little effort, he asked, to make nice with them? The tip tops of my ears felt like they were on fire. And that was the first sure sign that I was about to lose my temper. I had tried. Honest Abe I had. I'd done everything I could think of to make Iris and them be my friends. Earlier in the year, when all the girls in the class were wearing their hair in ponytails, I started having Mam put mine up in the morning. And when they all added ribbons to their hair, I found a pretty red one in Mam's sewing basket. Then, when they all cut their bangs, I did too. Never mind that Mam had the hardest time trying to get them even after the job I'd done with her sewing shears. Also, I wasn't proud of it, but I'd even done Iris's homework a time or two. It hadn't mattered at all in the end. She was mean to me anyway. 
I'll bet Iris wants to be your friend, Mr. Braun said. She's a very nice girl, don't you think? No, I do not, I answered. She's horrible. Now, why would you say that? I reminded him as respectfully as I could of the baby bumpkin song. Just good-natured teasing, he said. After all, sticks and stones may break my bones. He lifted his hand like he wanted me to finish that silly little rhyme, but I wouldn't do it. I bit my lips between my front teeth and shook my head. Come now, Florence. I made a mm -mm sound without opening my mouth. Surely you want to have friends, he said. I did, more than anything else in the world. So much that I couldn't help but burst into loud, heaving, messy tears just thinking about it. I didn't have a single friend in the entire world. Now, there, there, Mr. Braun said, pushing a box of tissues across the desk toward me. I didn't want his pity or his stupid tissues. I looked him right in the eye and reached on my shirt, grabbing both wads of toilet paper and used those instead. His jaw tensed, and he cleared his throat before telling me that I was dismissed. I took off ma'am's shoes and walked down the hallway in just my bobby socks. Flossie took over the story, and I was telling the group this morning, whenever I wrote Bertha's story, she was reliable. I knew what she would say. I knew what she would do. I knew what was going to happen in the game she was playing, which writing those scenes was so much fun. Um, but when I sat down to write Flossie's scenes, I had no idea what that child was going to do or say, and it was terrifying. Um, when I wrote that scene and she reaches down and grabs the tissues, I thought, my editor is going to want to cut that. And she didn't, so I'm really glad that she didn't. Um, the experience of writing this book was so fantastic, even though Flossie derailed quite a bit. Um, learning about women who have become my new heroes um, women who, who just played with all the love in their hearts, played baseball. And also learning about the people who survived McCarthyism and did not give up. Um, some people did let it derail their lives, but then there were people who continued their lives, like David Marinus's father, they relocated and they rebuilt their lives. And now David Marinus is, I don't even know how many books this man has written, so many. He is prolific, he has won so many awards, and um, including the Michigan Notable Book, which he won for this book. So um, this is definitely a worthy book. Um, and if you need something to counterbalance it, grab a copy of this book. It is, it is charming and will make you fall in love with these women and wish that you were 16, 17 years old and had those skills. I did not. I was not a good athlete. I didn't say that earlier. I was just an athlete. Um, so writing, was, writing this book was fantastic, but I have to say that um, the people that I've met, I have met more people through this book than any of my other books, um, both online and in person. Um, I've had people reach out to me from the women's baseball community um, that is, is striving to bring it back um, because there are women who are so good at baseball, not softball. Softball is fine, but baseball. Um, and they are working hard, and their community is like none other. They are so supportive. I have been um, welcomed into some of the greatest reading communities, thank you. This today has been just so encouraging to me and such a gift to me. Um, and that is even greater than the joy I had in writing this book. Um, I would love to answer your questions. I find that questions from the audience are greater than anything that I could think up um, because you know what you wanna know 
and I am open to answering almost anything. Writing, baseball, books, whatever. Oh, yeah. Just a question in your writing skills and your development. How do you start? Do you start with like a, an outline and then piece things together? How do you do that? That's a fantastic question. His question was about how I get started if I do an outline, what's my process, and um, I am finding that every novel is so different, but um, since I write in what is technically called historical fiction, I start with research. Um, I often have an idea of at least two characters who are going to kind of star in the book. And so as I'm researching, I research thinking about how that would be for them. Um, and in my research, I try to avoid um, this, these two resources here are very different from me. I tend to go for newspapers that were published in the year the, of the events because my characters would only know that. They wouldn't know a historical or a, a history reference book. Um, and so as I'm researching, I wish I would have brought it with you, but, um, or with me. I have this though. I, I am like, 13 years old, apparently, and I am very motivated by stickers, so there are stickers on everything I own. But um, I take a lot of notes. I jot down um, the characters and how old they would have been that year, and if there's going to be like a time shift, how old they would be in the second part, um, which I told the group earlier, I'm not great at math, so this is always the most challenging part. Um, but I read a lot of, of newspapers, books that I can, I can get my hands on and watch a lot of um, YouTube videos. Um, there are, this is something that I recommend. If you go on YouTube and you look up the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, you can actually hear the women tell their own stories. And they tell them better than I could. And um, they are, they're just, almost all of them are hilarious. <laughs> Um, and so then after I do the research, I don't do an outline. What I do is I print off a calendar from the year that I'm writing in, and I fill in historical things that happened on which date. Um, sometimes I will write the weather, which is conveniently right on the newspaper, um, and I, I use a website to find the newspapers. Um, I write down significant things that I want to have happen to my character, and it's all color-coded because my brain could not see it all in black ink. I would need it to be color-coded so I know this is real, this is fake. Um, and then I start doing what I call pre-writing, where I try to figure out the character's voice. I always write in first person, so it's where the character is narrating, because I love reading in all different point of view. But as far as writing goes, I feel an intimacy with the characters when I'm writing in their voice. And so I'm trying to figure out, it's like how it, an actor gets in character. It really is. It's how I figure out how to get into the character to write about them. And then I just go. And I often know key things that are going to happen in the novel. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers for The All-American, but I knew for instance, that she was going to go to tryouts for the Workington Sweet Peas. I knew who was going to drive her there. I knew the result of the tryouts. I knew, but I don't always know all the in-between things. So um, it's always kind of an adventure. Um, many writers explain it like this. It's like you're driving down the road and the only light are your headlights. So you can only see just so much in front of you. And it is sometimes terrifying, but it's always thrilling, especially when I realize that my brain has worked out things connecting <laughs> before I even realize it does, um, which it's, it's always fun when those connections come about. And then I do a lot of editing, and that's my favorite part. I love editing. Do I begin with a specific ending in mind? Sometimes. Um, I would say that, 
probably 75% of the time, I know exactly how it's going to end. That doesn't always mean that I want it to end that way, and so I try to resist it. And when I try to resist that, it goes wrong. Like with this one, that's why it took me a lot of time to write this book. Did you base your thought on the book person that from all the research you did uh, with looking at the base, the real baseball player? The question was if I based Bertha on one of the baseball players. Actually, no. Um, and yes. So I read, um, se there are several books, and I forgot to bring them, but there are several books in which the women were interviewed, and so their stories are written down as they tell them. And so I got an idea of like a bunch of the different personalities that went into each of the teams. And so I thought, well, I can, I can work with that for the different players on this team. Um, but really, Bertha, her character, her personality, the way she looks in my brain is like my great aunt Bertha, who um, she, she was actually, she worked at GM during the war. She, um, and then a man came and took her job after the war. But um, she was one of those spunky, go-getter, um, she was the person, I, I can say, I grew up, I went to church with her, I saw her every Sunday, we had the same birthday. Um, and if there was one person I grew up wanting to be like, it was her. Because she was tough, she played sports with the boys in, in the park, you know, she was that girl. And so, um, I always knew, I've known for years, that I wanted to write a character modeled after her. I was waiting for the right book. And so when I started doing research into the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, I thought, oh, she would have been, she would have fit right in. Um, and it, I wish that my family had been a baseball family because maybe she would have um, played. I think she could have done some pretty good stuff. She was more of a basketball player, but basketball is cool too. And then Flossie, um, she's kind of, she's got some attributes of me, um, they both do, but when I look, when I see Flossie in my brain, I see a girl that was in my Sunday school class in first grade named Jenny. I don't know what happened to Jenny, but in the 80s, she was wearing poodle skirts, and she had like hair that could never like, it was never right. And um, she, was, she was smaller than everybody else. We didn't make fun of her, um, but I think she got made fun of at school. So she was, she was a little bit on the fringes, and she was a little bit like eccentric. And so every time I see Flossie, I see Jenny in my brain um, with her hair that I just was like, can someone? But my hair was like that too, I'm sure. <laughs> Do I have a favorite book? That no, that is. <laughs> Are they like children? No, I, I very intentionally do not see them as my children because if people went online and said mean things about my children in a review, I would find them <laughs> and, and have a conversation with them. So people can say mean things about these. It doesn't really usually bother me. Um, it's just they're all so different and they came from a different part of me. Um, I would say that the ones that, if I think about them and they still make me cry, it's the all-American and all manner of things. But Stories That Bind Us is special to me in a lot of ways too, um, because it's about the power of story and that's something that I obviously believe in. <laughs> what have you got next? Well, okay, so I don't write romance. I'm just going to say that right now. But after I got done writing The All-American, um, an editor friend and I were talking, because in Grand Rapids there are a lot of publishers, and an editor friend and I were talking about how I was burned out. Um, nine novels in ten years, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, a lot of different characters, a lot of different stories, a lot of different work. And I just said, I don't know what's next for me. And she said, well, um, the publisher I work for is doing a novella collection. So a novella is like a third of a novel. 
And she said, why don't you write one? We're looking for one from World War I, World War II, and Vietnam era. She said, why don't you write the Vietnam era? You've already done the research, because all manner of things was set during the Vietnam era. And I said, oh, sure, okay, yeah. So I signed the contract, cashed the check, spent the check, because it was small, and, um, <laughs> and then I was in a Zoom call with the other two authors. And we're professional women. And I was sitting there, and the, the editor said, now this romance collection. And I went, what? What is this? And she said, it's about a wedding dress that goes from a bride during each wartime. And I was like, but that doesn't have to be romantic. Apparently, it does. It's in the contract I didn't necessarily read because that's my agent's job. <laughs> um, I will always read my contracts now. So I just wrote a romance novella, and that uh, releases in August, and my dad said, this one I might not read. <laughs> it's, not, it's not too bad. It's, it's just different. Um, so that, and now I am doing research and pre-writing for a novel that I am, the working title is Etta Z and the Misfits Club, and it is about three girls. Um, it has three different timelines. So the first one is 1959 when they're in middle school, and they, they realize they don't quite fit in, but they all love music. And then the 1970s, somewhere in there, when they have a band and they're trying to be cool, and then um, more modern when they're um, older women and they're doing one more show. Um, but they never become famous. So um, I'm doing the research for that and that is such fun because I'm learning a lot about music in the 70s and now my children are like, do we have to listen to all the music from the 70s? And I'm like, yes, sit down and listen to Led Zeppelin right now. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm working on right now. And actually, I'm, I'm doing a lot of traveling for the All-Americans still. Um, there, there's just something about baseball, women's baseball, that people are just so interested in. Um, and just the fact that 80 years after the very first season, they still have um, reunions every year. They still have... Um, Oh, social media presence <laughs> everywhere. Um, they still have people watching the movie and the new series that came out. So there, there's still so much appreciation for these women and for the, for the league. And um, that's, that's really fun. Early in your presentation, you talk about how you start out with short stories. Did you include yourself or friends you were with, experiences that you went through to, to get the your story theme and completion done in that way? What was your inspiration to do and who were they? So the short stories, when I got the ideas from the friends, um, they were just my pals on Facebook that were giving me ideas. So people I went to college with and um, different things like that. And it was, it was pretty bonkers. Like some of their ideas, it was like, that's impossible. That, how, do, how do you write that story? But I, I tried to figure it out. Um, and a lot of those friends have, um, they are still constantly reading my books. I have some of the most supportive friends. And so they were there um, giving me inspiration when I was feeling down and feeling like my career wasn't going to happen. And um, cheering me on when I was writing all these short stories for free and they're not the best writing I've ever done um, because I didn't have time to edit <laughs> but um, they they are there they show up at events I have something in Lansing next week that a bunch of friends are showing up to and it's just you know I think that we cannot we cannot um, put enough value on our friends that give us support and give us inspiration, give us ideas. Um, and because of that, I write a lot of my friends into my stories. <laughs> um, so in The All-American, um, Amy Housecamp is second base, and she is actually a poet. 
who has has been a huge encouragement to me. Um, and Juju Ames is based on a friend, Justin, who said, you're writing a baseball book, you have to write me into it. And I was like, okay. Um, and I made him go to MSU because he's a U of M fan. Um, and he hasn't read it yet because if he had, he would be calling me to chew me out. Um, <laughs> I'm an MSU fan. I'm, is it safe? Okay. Um, <laughs> yes? Oh, no. Oh. So far, I'm safe so far. <laughs> I like the Lions, right? They had a good year. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I love writing my friends into the stories in all, or all manner of things. Jacob, the, um, Joel Jacobson is an actual person. He's a good friend of mine. So I, I just like putting them in and having little um, Easter eggs for people to find. And I was telling the group earlier today, my niece is 15 and she reads all of my books. And um, in the All-American, I had in the newspaper listed the names of a bunch of communists and I made them be all of her male cousins so that when she was reading it, she could, she apparently squealed and laughed and screamed because it was so funny to her. Yeah. Do you have a writing routine? Like do you write like nine to five? Or how do you fit this in with your life as a teenager? They go to school. <laughs> so I take them to school and then um, then I, I try to get some writing done. I do better if I'm at a coffee shop because there's less to distract me. My cat, it's my cat. She's the distraction. Her name is Flannery and she is needy. Like right now she's probably very sad because I'm not home. Does this frame ramp have a minor lead team? What is it, lug nuts or? We have the lug nuts, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's Lansing, I'm sorry. We have the white caps. I'm sorry, I'm from Lansing. I get myself all confused. And I actually worked for the lug nuts when they were first starting off. I do. Do you know, I've been tweeting at them, and I need to email them to try to get them to do a Grand Rapids Chicks night, um, because that was our team, was the Grand Rapids Chicks. And um, Rockford does an amazing job, like, with the peaches. They're, they're everywhere. And I'm like, the Grand Rapids Chicks, that's pretty awesome. Um, we do, I will say, we have an, a mural um, that is gorgeous. It's just beautiful in Grand Rapids. If you're ever there, go to Grand Rapids Chicks Way. That's the street name, and it's just this huge mural. But I've been trying to get the Whitecaps to do some night when they honor the Grand Rapids Chicks because that's my team. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I should talk to them and say, hey, let me throw out the pitch and let me have like a cheat so I can be like a lot closer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. That would be a lot of fun. Or I could dress up as a mascot. Well, I have got terrible handwriting, and there are times when I can't even read it. Um, but I also write very slowly. I had surgery on my hand when I was a kid, so I write so slowly um, that typing is just faster, and, um, and a laptop is just portable. Um, I do, however, have software that will block, like during a certain time, will block Facebook and Amazon and Twitter, well, whatever it is now, and all of those things, so I can't. And if I try to get on it, it pops up this screen that's like, you'll never accomplish your goals if you're looking at social media. And so it makes me feel guilty. Um, and I've found that um, paper, bad things can happen to paper. <laughs> I learned that the hard way a few times. So um, 
I have my documents triple and quadruple backed up because I am so scared. Um, one time my husband unknowingly turned off my computer and lost 8,000 words of a novel. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm a little paranoid. He, I love him. He's a very, very nice man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I do, um, I have friends who handwrite. Um, I know Gary Schmidt, who is a Grand Rapids writer, he has one of those out back in, in the yard type sheds with his, his typewriter. And um, that's actually how the author in this book does it, because um, their, their father is an author. And um, I just, I do better at the kitchen table, even if there's chaos, because I'm the youngest of four, chaos is kind of my default. So if there's lots going on, I just put earbuds in and I'm fine. But the closer I am to the coffee maker, the better. <laughs> well, if there are no other questions, I thank you so much. Thank you.